Ephesians 4, verse 17. As we begin the new year, let's hear the word of the Lord together. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ this week I found you. myself uh, at the beginning of the day reaching for a pair of my favorite wool socks off the dresser. They uh, were among my best hunting socks, not cheap, uh, but I received them as a gift probably from my sister some years ago and I had them for quite a while. And as you know, maybe you don't know, but good hunting socks are not just worn for hunting. They're for general use as well. Anyway, they are my favorite ones. They're thick, they're uh, soft, they're comfortable, and... Um, to be desired. And as I was about to put them on, I noticed one small problem, and that is the heels of both socks had huge gaping holes. And with some sadness and some disappointment, some frustration, I tossed them into the garbage. Now, if your dresser or closet is anything like mine, it may also have some hidden surprises, things you cling to, but you probably should toss. I mean unflattering slacks, shirts that no longer fit, socks with gaping holes, bulky sweatpants that never see the light of day and certainly never should. Uh, then there's the story about the teenage girl you heard, I'm sure. Um, she was out um, one night and uh, with the car and her purse was stolen from the car and she returned home and made the necessary calls to the police and then she called the credit card companies and, and the bank to, to have her information stopped and uh, uh, after she did all that she knew that it was time to do the really hard thing to wake up her mother and tell her that she was home and that her purse had been stolen and uh, she stepped into her mother's bedroom and she said mom are you still awake and her mother said what's the matter and she said someone broke into my car and stole my purse. And her mother said, which purse, honey? And she said, the green suede one. And the mother sat up in bed, she turned the light on, and she said, the green suede one? With that dress you have on? <laughs> well, let's face it, the standards of public decency have changed. Today we have the infamous yoga pants, which are worn in public, which I personally deem offensive and a disgrace to womanhood. You can disagree with me, but it won't change my mind. Then we have what's called the grunge look, okay? That's where human beings wear clothing that looks like, uh, looks like something that got caught in a piece of operating farm machinery and was torn to shreds. Now, I'm no ex expert in fashion, but I do understand that 
Kurt Cobain popularized that grunge look before he himself commits suicide in 1994. Now beside that odd association for the fashion world, when I was growing up, if you had holes in your clothing, your parents would never let you get past the door. Except if you were going out to clear rock off the fields, then you could wear something like that. But now it's become fashionable. There's another thing called the washed out look. Did you know that according to the 2017 figures from the US EPA, the recycling rate for all of the textiles in America was 15.2% with 2.6 million tons recycled. The problem is that they missed a lot of clothing because it happens to be still on human bodies which are not recyclable. Now in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul's first phrase is a word that looks back. It's the word therefore. And anytime you see the word therefore, you should stop and ask what it is therefore. What precedes it in the context? Well, the word therefore calls Paul's readers' minds back to what he had been teaching about their high calling in Christ. And he says, because you've been given all of the benefits mentioned in verses 1 through 16, you're not to live a life like the lost, like the pagan Gentiles all around you in your society. And specifically, the benefits that he's talking about were our calling to salvation by grace through faith, then our unity in the body of Christ, then our unique endowment by the Holy Spirit, to serve the Lord and his church for his glory, and then are being built up, edified, through the mutual ministries, the gifts that God has given to each of the persons in the church, just like Chris and Katie ministered to us a few moments ago. The point is this, because we've been given all the advantages, and we've been made partakers of such gifts from God, we walk in a manner that is different from those outside the faith. So as you look at the heathen society that begins a new year, it's marked by a certain fashion. You look at it and it's as if you're taking a fashion catalog of these times that we live in and now you're leafing through the catalog and you're seeing what's in vogue. Well, what was in vogue in Paul's day in the first century among the heathen pagan are also in vogue in many of our areas of our society today. First, notice their heads. What was on their heads? They walk in the futility of their mind. That is, their lives were and are empty. They're purposeless. They're fruitless. The lost live empty lives because their minds are corrupted by an inborn sin that dwells still within them. Consequently, every thought, every idea, every assumption is automatically corrupted by evil. The lost mind invents ways to serve the flesh and the selfish desires of the mind. In other words, it invents false gods, false religions, false philosophies that are designed to do what? To showcase man's brilliance, to give man's pride a boost. But they don't reflect the values of the kingdom of God. Yet the inventions of the lost mind are empty. They are anything but helpful. And ultimately, they're even damning to their eternal soul. Because in Proverbs 16.25, Solomon says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end, it's the way of death. Now don't misunderstand me. Paul wasn't saying that people outside of Christ aren't using their minds. Oh my! They're using their minds, but they're using their minds in a destructive, deceitful, depraved way. Today, there's lots of intellectual activity by unbelievers, and it's showing up in gross movies, gross entertainment. It's showing up in greater deceit in the economic world and in Wall Street. It's showing up in more deceitful ways in the commercial industry and all of that. Solomon said this, I've seen everything that's done under the sun. And it has one common theme. If it's among unredeemed, unregenerate pagan people, all is vanity. It's a striving after the wind. 
Now, if we're honest with ourselves, life can often make us feel like hamsters running on that wheel. We run as hard as we can and we never make any real progress. It's, everything is just one repetitive cycle. Laundry and dishes are two supreme examples. I mean, we clean, we organize, and we temporarily banish the chaos, and then in no time at all, it returns. Similarly, we go to work, we make a paycheck, the paycheck goes to our expenses, and um, we continue working for the next check so that we can pay the next round of expenses. I mean, how sensible is this? Life is a hamster wheel. It's a steady cycle, yes, but it's monotony. And it ultimately only ends with death. Now the second thing we see in the heathen clothing catalog is the heart. We've already looked at the head, now it's the heart. There's a problem with the heart. Notice what he says in verse 18, their understanding is darkened. In other words, they don't think right. They're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of what? The blindness of their own heart. And the word blindness refers really to stubbornness. It speaks of a heart that has been confronted with the truth but refuses to acknowledge the truth. Now you know that Paul spoke of that also in Romans. He said, there are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And the word there to hold means to suppress it. It's to hold it down so that it can't express itself. You don't give it a fair hearing. And because of the stubbornness of their hearts, they're separated from the life of God that they could have and could be theirs in Christ. But as it is, they remain trapped in the darkness and the depravity of their own condition. Now, whether we like it or not, when we speak and we see people in the world, we see how society is functioning outside of God, the one thing we need to know is that it's not a matter of saying, well, some people are bad and some people are good. That's not, never the problem in the Bible. The problem is always much more serious. It's some people are dead and some people are alive. See, when Adam sinned, God didn't say, you're going to get sick. He said, the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. And what we're dealing with today is we're dealing with not men and women who are sick. No, no. We're dealing with people who are dead. There's only two classes of people. Those who are dead in sin and those who are dead to sin. The unbelieving, unregenerate person is dead in sin. The Christian who has been redeemed by Christ is dead to sin. That's the difference. And inasmuch as the people who are dead in sin are in a depraved state, they only live to gratify their lusts. There's no other higher calling than that. They can't rise any higher than that. They live to satisfy their animal instincts. Now in this state, their understanding is darkened. The phrase is a perfect participle in Greek and it means that they're in a continuing state of spiritual darkness and ignorance toward the things of God, that is. Oh, they may understand deep books. They may understand how to do mathematical calculations, geometry. But since they are dead spiritually, they're unresponsive to all of the things, all of the promises, all of the truths, all of the instructions in this book. They're cold, they're immobile, they're like a corpse. They can't see, they can't feel, they can't hear anything as it relates to the eternal values of the kingdom. They are unmoved by the truth, they're unfazed by the matters of right and wrong, they love the dark, and consequently they pursue the world of darkness and the works of darkness. Now that's the head and that's the heart, but then notice that the catalog goes on, you turn another page and there's a problem with this, their hands. Because the lost are dead and their past feeling, they have lost all sense of pain. What do we mean by that? 
they're not bothered in their conscience by the things they do. You know what happens in leprosy? Leprosy develops and deforms the body and the limbs in such a way that the main problem is that the leper no longer feels pain. They don't know when they're cutting themselves. They don't know when there is an open sore. They know nothing. And that's when gangrene sets into their extremities because they have no sense of pain. And basically, Paul says, when you don't realize any pain in your conscience, you commit your life to evil and you lose all sensitivity towards sin. And it leads you to ever deepening levels of wickedness. Turn on the news, see what's going on in America, and don't fail to ask yourself, are we as a nation going to stand before a holy God and be judged for the message of immorality that we are sending to the rest of the world? Lord, have mercy on us. What we're doing, dragging the world to judgment. That word is lasciviousness. It means unbridled sensuality. Now this week I noticed the announcement of a conference summary of a major denomination in America. You know it. Who are considering splitting for one reason. Because within that denomination, this historic denomination founded by John Wesley, there is a departure of those who insist that the homosexuality lifestyle be recognized as legitimate. It's an attitude that says, I'll do what I want, when I want it, with whom I please, and I won't care about what anyone else says or thinks. Now, it's a life of unrestricted, sinful indulgence. And that's where we're headed as a nation. Now, the lost all around us work themselves to death in the pursuit of one thing, their own pleasure, never realizing their own wickedness and the corrupting effect it's having on them and how it is moving them past feeling. They don't care anymore. The Bible says their conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. Now notice, lastly, there's one other thing. They do all of this with one attitude. The attitude is greediness. In other words, they have no concern how their fashions may affect others. Their God is their appetite, and they worship their appetite. They worship self. They give themselves over to self and the lusts that dry them, drive them. Head, heart, hands. Where are they? You look at the catalog, you see it. They're dressed in filthy rags. That's the fashion catalog of the lost pagan world. And yes, admittedly, it's a bleak picture without any future. But now let's move from there to the picture or the description of those on the other side. Those who have come to faith. Those who have recognized Jesus Christ. They have done an interesting thing. They have taken and they have put off the old man and they have put on the new man in Christ. And as a result of that new birth, they are not what they used to be. The clothing style of the old man no, no longer represents them. They've put on Christ. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it obviously means they're different. They've experienced the intervention of God's grace in their own lives. They're very different when they present themselves to the world. They're very conscious that they have and represent Jesus Christ. 
they understand that they are not their own, they're bought with a price, and they should glorify God both in their body and in their spirit, both of which belong to God. Secondly, they're discerning. Notice verse 20 and 21. They are specifically discerning of someone, and that's Jesus Christ. They're discerning of Christ as their example. Now, just as the lost are motivated by their lusts, believers are motivated by two things, Christ's holiness and his purity. Jesus is the only person who ever walked the earth who could make the statement that he did. Which of you convicts me of sin? Now, I can't say that because you, oh, Mark, I could tell you a billion things you do. Talk to my wife. But what about Jesus? We could never say that about Jesus. Jesus was pure and holy, and Paul held up Jesus against the background of everything that was collapsing in the world around him, and nothing could be a greater contrast. And he was saying, telling the Ephesians, you've learned something from Christ. You've learned something from Christ. And it doesn't automatically mean that everything that we do or think or say once we become Christians, once we come to Christ, that automatically becomes perfect. No, no. But here's the thing. If we keep listening to Christ in his word, in worship, in service, we slowly experience the putting off of the old man and the putting on of the new. You know what it says in Psalm 63, 8 about this? Very interesting words, I find. Some of the most interesting in the whole Bible. It says, my soul follows hard after you. My soul follows hard after you. I once was out biking when I served in the Poconos and I had a black Labrador. And the black Labrador followed me on the bicycle. He could keep up with me like anything. But one day I got lost thinking that I could make this huge loop back to the church and parsonage. It was miles. I was running along a, a highway on the bicycle. The dog was with me. The dog ran and ran and kept up with me. Even when I was going down steep hills. What about your soul? He was panting. He was desperate to keep up with me. What about my soul pursuing Christ? Is there that kind of devotion? Is there that kind of commitment? Now, as you look back over the past year, do you see a process of following hard after Christ? If not, if your thoughts are re returning to the same attitudes and actions of the past, it may be because you're gravitating, get this now, you're gravitating to those comfortable socks with the holes in them rather than Christ. I don't really like the word change because I think it's inadequate. But in clothing, that's the idea. We put off the old filthy rags, we put on the new. It speaks of something that we call sanctification. And 1 Thessalonians 4 says, this is God's will for you in the new year. I added in the new year. God's will for you is to be holy is your sanctification. That you would abstain and avoid from anything that is immoral. Now that's not easy to do in this society. We have television, we have entertainment, we have the internet, we have all sorts of deceptive and deceitful and malicious things being said. It's hard to keep your mind and your thoughts clean and pure. 
But the results of that are what we present to the world. You can't hide it. It will come out. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. How about it? What's going in is going to be what comes out. But since we've been changed by God's power, and since we've been taught the truth about God in Christ, we're to make some changes on our own. And there's three statements here that we must not miss. There's a statement about what we are to renounce. We're to put off the old man. That means we're to strip it away. It's the image of taking off the clothes like the athletes did before they ran a race. The Bible says, set aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and run with patience the race that is set before you. We take certain things off. And then there is something that we are to renew. The lost sinner has a mind. The mind is given over to vanity and futility. The saint, on the other hand, has a renewed mind. When Christ saves us, he makes us alive, and the Bible says, now our goal is to set our minds on things above, not on things below. How much time do you think about eternity? How much time do you think about where you're going to spend eternity? How much time do you think about heaven? How much do you think about where Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal? How much of your attention is set on storing up treasure in heaven. Even if you only have one more year to live. What in that time frame can you be doing that will be an investment in heaven? What can you leave behind? Who can you speak to? Who can you challenge? Who can you encourage? Who can you instruct? Who can you disciple? Who can you lead to Christ? Those are the stars in your crown, and then that's the crown that you're going to throw at Jesus' feet. And then there's one final thing. There's something not only to renounce, there's not only something to renew, but there's something to reveal. You see, just as we strip off the old man, we're to put on the new man who's created in true righteousness and holiness. The new holy man is born in us by the supernatural work of God's Holy Spirit. And we're empowered. How are we empowered? Well, when he saved us, he made us a new creature, and a new creature loves the Creator. He doesn't get attracted to other things that are created. He gets attracted to the Creator. And he's empowered in his walk with the Lord by that view, by constantly placing the emphasis on Christ. There was one point in the Gospels where a group of people come to Peter and they ask this question. Sir, we would see Jesus. What would happen in the life of a church? What would happen in our own private lives if we said, you know what? I'm not really concerned about knowing a lot of information every day shoved into my head. And over, but I, there's one thing I would like to know. I would see Jesus. I want to see more of Jesus in my own life. I want to see more of Jesus in my family. I want to see more of Jesus in the church. I want to see more of Jesus in my neighborhood. I want to see more of Jesus taking over every aspect of my life. That's what it means to put on the new man. It means you speak the truth, not half-truths. 
It means you have a certain righteous indignation, not selfish anger over what was done to you, but righteous anger over your concerns for the kingdom of Christ. There's forgiveness instead of holding grudges. And that's no easy thing. There's self-control instead of temper tantrums. There's generosity instead of stealing from others either their money or their time. There's edification. There's speech that builds up rather than tears down. And there's nothing that grieves the Holy Spirit of God. What about it? What are you wearing? We must no longer walk in the rags of sin, but we must put on the new man, partakers of the divine nature, and say with the Apostle Paul, I'm crucified with Christ. That's the old man. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this body of flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you want to know how you're going to live a victorious and vital Christian life in the new year? There's only one way. You're going to live it as you allow Christ to live it through you. Let him clothe you in his righteousness, in his purity, in his holiness. Let him empower you with his spirit and let him lead you to victory, to a valid, to a vital, and to a victorious new year.